Hey friends, it's Jessica from Three Rivers Homestead and earlier this week in the community section of my YouTube channel, I mentioned to you that it was a crazy week here <laughs> at Three Rivers Homestead. I was very busy potty training my youngest child, Benjamin. He's about 27 months old and I figured it was a good time. Things were slowing down with outdoor work. I just decided to bite the bullet and get it done because we have a new baby coming in a couple months and it would be really convenient to have him out of diapers before we have another diapered baby in the house. And I have to say it's gone amazingly well. Today is the fifth day that we've been potty training him and he is basically day trained. He's been trained since probably day three. No accidents. He's doing great. Um, and then he's uh, mostly night trained. He's been dry three out of four nights that we've um, been training him. So things are going remarkably well, but it really took all of my focus this week. I really had to have him by my side and just focus on getting fluids in him and making sure he <laughs> was doing his job and getting to the potty on time. And so I didn't have time to do kitchen projects and film it for you guys. And so in the community tab, I had mentioned that I would still love to do a video for you this week and I wanted to put out a Q&A. So that's what I'm doing. I have two pages here of questions that you guys provided me in that community tab and I'd like to go through as many of these as possible. So I have done other Q&As before and I'm going to link them in the description because a lot of the common questions that I get asked I've already answered in multiple Q&A videos basic things about, you know, Adam and I's background, why we home church, why we chose to homeschool, all of those kinds of things um, can be answered in those previous Q&As that I'm going to link for you. Um, what I'm going to do is kind of different questions today that I feel like I've never really addressed before for you. And so to make this easier, I've divided these into different categories. If you go to the description, I'm going to have them separated out by category and then with a timestamp of where those questions begin relating to that topic or category. So if you're someone who doesn't have children or doesn't homeschool, if you went down to the timestamps, you could just completely skip over the homeschooling section and go on to maybe gardening or go on to food preservation or whatever interests you. So at the beginning of each topic or category, I'm just gonna give you some general information that I feel like can sum up the majority of the questions and then I'll get into some more specific questions. So with all that said, uh, bear with me. I'm getting really out of breath lately because I am seven months pregnant. And um, yeah, so trying my best. And I talk really fast when I get excited about things. So that makes me even more out of breath. So just bear with me. All right, here we go. Okay, so the first category that I have listed here is just our kind of general home and homestead questions. So let me give you an overview of what we're working with here at Three Rivers Homestead. So we are located in Northwest Ohio. We have a little under four acres here and um, a, almost two of those acres are devoted entirely to pasture. That's where we grow out our beef cows. Since we only have two acres of pasture, we never grow more than two beef cows at a time. We currently have one full-size heifer. She's ready to be processed here in the next month or two. Um, and then two brand new calves that we got. So there are three out there right now, but it's for such a short period of time that the two acres of pasture is more than enough for them. Um, but typically we'll just have two beef cows out there. We would love to expand and have more pasture, but we're just working with, with what we have um, right now. We have another maybe three quarters of an acre of the property that is completely untouched. We let it grow wild. We call it our junk woods. You've seen it in some videos. There's a lot of really like junky trees out there that will grow up and then they end up dying and we just use them for firewood. There's a lot of wildflowers. We do a lot of foraging out there for plants, but the bees really love it. The main reason I like to keep that growing wild is because it's just a pollinator haven. And you guys know that we raise bees here for honey. And so that's a place where they just really thrive because outside of our property, we're like this little oasis for the pollinators in the middle of these conventional ag soybean fields and corn fields. So we like having that safe space for the pollinators to just 
um, get all the food that they need. <laughs> so that's about three quarters of an acre. And then our house and Adam's garage and kind of the area that the children play in probably sits on about a half an acre. And then we have a whole nother half an acre that contains our barn. We have two chicken runs and then my garden space. So that is pretty much what we're working with in terms of land here on our homestead. We would love to have more land. We've contacted the neighbors on one side of our property and asked them if they were willing to sell us some of the adjacent cornfield over there, and they're just not interested in that right now. The neighbor on the other side of us, um, we just keep waiting one day. As they get older, if their house were to go up for sale, they have about seven acres on their property that we would love to snatch that up one day, and that's kind of our dream in the future. But So for now, that's what we're working with, and it's amazing what we can grow on just about four acres. We do, we're pretty happy with what we have going on here. Our house itself is 1,600 square feet. Its original portion of the house was built in 1867, so over 150 years ago. It's a very old farmhouse, and as with most old farmhouses, it's just a series of additions that are very inefficiently built <laughs> and stacked behind one another. Um, so when I say it's 1,600 square feet, it's actually a pretty inefficient 1,600 square feet, not a lot of closet space. You know, we're just, we work with what we have, and you guys know I'm pregnant with my eighth child, so there will soon be 10 of us living in 1,600 square feet, and you know what? We just make it work. We do have Adam's pole barn garage outside. It was created to be a workshop for him, <laughs> but as the children have grown, it's sort of become a rec room area and a home gym. We have um, workout equipment out there. There are some nice comfy chairs and a TV and the, the men folk like to go out there and, <laughs> and watch their football games and stuff. And we'll sometimes do family movies out there because there's a wood stove to heat it. Um, it's also a rec area. We have a pool table out there and dart boards and things like that. So if in the winter our house ever feels kind of crowded, it's a great place for us to escape. Um, especially for some of the teenagers to escape and kind of go out there and have some fun. So that's what works for us. One of the questions I received is, are we planning on building on to our home as our family grows? And that's a good question because I don't know if I'd mentioned it on YouTube, but last year on Instagram, we were talking about how we have a rather large unfinished attic space attached to where the children's bedrooms are. And we could make a really decent sized play area or even a schoolroom or something out of that. And so we were considering doing that. Um, we had also considered for a while building a dining room space onto the back of the house. And just as we were kind of getting ready to make a decision on which one of those things we wanted to follow through on, we had an excavator come out and give us a quote on fixing the foundation of our house. And we have basically decided that any extra funds that we would have in home remodeling are now going to go towards this cellar project. So we do have a very old cellar that is very damp, as a lot of old farmhouses are. <laughs> um, our foundation is very old and it just needs some work. So starting this December and January, they're going to be exposing the whole foundation, um, waterproofing all of that, and we have to run some tiles to get the water away from the foundation. We have to, there's an old cistern there that needs to be crushed and filled in. There, the gray water system is not up to code. It needs to be rerouted to our septic and our septic also needs replaced. So it's a huge can of worms that we're opening and doing this project. But the goal is that by the time February comes and the project is all over, Lord willing, we will have a dry cellar I can finally move all of my food storage down into a functioning root cellar down there and it will clear up a whole lot of space in our home for other things. And so it will definitely make our 1600 square feet feel a lot larger than it is once we can utilize all that storage space that is sitting right underneath our feet <laughs> but is currently unusable because it's so wet. So that's our plan for now. So as you guys know, we have seven kids. The eighth is on the way. Our oldest, Gabriel, just turned 15 in August, and our current youngest child, um, Benjamin, as I mentioned, is 27 months old. 
So when this baby is born, you know, we'll have the spectrum all the way from newborn up to, you know, 15 years old. And so lots of unique challenges. One of the questions I got is what's the hardest part about having a large family? And for me as a mom, the hardest part is simply juggling being in all of those different stages of motherhood at the same time. You know, <clears throat> I feel like when we first started having children, we had four of them that were like age five and under in the beginning. And it was almost more manageable at that point because everybody was in that little kid season of life. And then, you know, as they grew up, we had a couple that were in, you know, the elementary school aged, and then we still had babies and stuff. But that still seemed manageable because everybody felt so young and their needs were still very home-based and very simple. It was just providing them, you know, adequate playtime and <laughs> food and, and, you know, making sure they sleep well and all of that. But then as they grow, that comes with new challenges. You know, teenagers, there's um, teaching them how to navigate out in the real world and come and dealing with all of the emotions and physical changes that happen as they grow and preparing for that next stage of life. You know, next, this time next year, I'll have a child who's driving and will likely want a job, a part-time job outside of the home. Um, he's not too far away from, um, taking college classes. He has plans to do, um, like a dual enrollment program through a college next year. And so it's just, a lot in as a mom in a mental space to navigate all of those new that new uncharted territory as a mom of older children while still having another foot firmly planted in the world of newborns and nursing and diapers so it does often feel very um like i have to switch mindsets very often like okay now i'm big big kid mom, I've got to focus on these issues. And then it's like, oh, okay, now I've got to focus on little kid issues. That's my biggest challenge. But in all, the benefits of a large family outweigh all of those challenges. It's a beautiful, wonderful thing because while I have to um, focus on the big kids, I have other big kids that are helping me entertain the little ones. And I didn't have that when they were all little, you know, and, and there's a lot less hands-on work that I have to do with the little ones because they see big kids modeling behavior for them that teaches them. Like, for example, the potty training that I did was so much harder when I just had little kids versus the last two children that I've potty trained. It has gone so quickly and easily and smoothly because they have all of these older kids that have modeled this behavior and are keeping an eye on them and giving them praise for what they're doing. And it just makes everything so much easier. Um, in that regard. So definitely the pros and cons balance themselves out. Actually, the pros of a large family obviously outweigh the cons or I wouldn't continue <laughs> to grow my family. So um, we love it. Um, but anything worth doing is going to come with some challenges um, and you just roll with the punches. <laughs> so that's one of the questions. Sorry, I'm looking down so I can remember. Um, People have asked about the children and how do I balance how many chores, how much chores and academic work is right, you know, to give a child. And I guess my answer to that is it's going to be different for every family and every family situation. My children are homeschooled, so their life is very different than a child who is public schooled. The average public schooled child or even private schooled child may be away from home the majority of the day and by the time they get home they might have some homework to do or they might have some obligations and commitments outside of the home with activities that they need to do and so piling on a bunch of extra chores to their day when they're already um, very busy outside of the home might not seem like the right thing to do but when your child is homeschooled you know the hours where a traditionally schooled child would be away from the home, I have to fill those hours with activity, with productive activity for my children to make sure that they're learning and growing and obviously being productive instead of just laying around and playing all day. And while there are definitely benefits to play, and I prefer that they're playing when they're younger, as they get older, the time that they spend needs to be benefiting them and getting them one step closer to the goal of leaving the nest and being productive out in society. 
So I do not feel bad um, giving a large chore load to my older children who are homeschooled because it gives them something to do during the day. It's teaching them life skills. It's teaching them hard work. You know, otherwise the alternative is they get their schoolwork done, which when you're homeschooled, there's it takes a lot less time to get your daily work done than if you're in a traditional school setting. If they didn't have chores to do, they would get their schoolwork done and then they would just all day be running around like, <laughs> what, what would they do with their time, you know? So the chores serve the purpose of filling their time productively. Now, um, obviously, we want them to have free time and I find that my children have, my older children that are teens, have probably three or so hours in the afternoon every day that are free for them to do whatever they want and um, they fill that time very easily <laughs> and then they also have a lot of time in the evening that is free to do whatever they want but otherwise the majority of their day is either doing their schoolwork or doing chores um, or just sitting around and hanging out with mom and <laughs> we're learning and and doing things together so um, yeah I, I can't really answer the question of what amount is right I just think you have to feel out your specific family scenario and you know, it's funny because I'll have on the same YouTube video, there'll be like a day in the life video where I'm showing what, you know, I do and what my children do. In that same video, I'll have one comment where someone will say, your children work too hard, you treat them like slaves, it's child labor. <laughs> and then I might have another comment that someone says, you're working too hard as a mom of seven, your children should be doing more to pick up the slack. So it's like, no matter what you do, it's never going to be right to someone because we all just have different opinions of what that balance of chores should look like for children. And you just need to find what works for you and for your unique situation and ignore what other people have to say because you're never going to make everybody happy. <laughs> your job is just to make your family function well and raise your children up in a way that brings glory and honor to the Lord and that is teaching them the life skills they need to be productive in the world. Speaking of how my children fill their free time, I had some questions about that. Like, do the kids have any interests outside of what I show here? Um, what are their career aspirations and things like that? And yeah, you, you know, you have to remember that I only show a small portion of our lives here. And I don't, um, I try to keep a balance of not intruding on my children's privacy too much and showing too much about, you know, too much about them um, and so yeah they have lots of interests and activities and things that they do that I don't show here um, my older my oldest son is very into computers computer programming computer animation he also loves um, creating films and cartoons and doing a lot of that kind of editing um, he does that with his brothers and his siblings he has a wide variety of actors and, a and actresses that he can use to be in his films that he creates so those are things that he loves to do. My second son, David, enjoys doing a lot of those things with his big brother. Um, he's really good at like pixelation and animation, and he does a lot of that for his brother's productions that he's making. Um, but David also, as you know, loves to bake and fills a lot of his free time doing that. He's also very into statistics. He loves to collect sports cards and watch things like football games, and he takes very detailed statistics during the games or takes the statistics off of the back of the cards and he compiles these very elaborate like Excel spreadsheets and he has them for all different kinds of sports over the years. If he doesn't end up a baker, I could see him becoming a sports stati statistician one day because he loves that. Um, that's an area that I don't really talk about a lot here. Um, Grace, as you know, loves to sew um, and she's always crafting, whether it's knitting, crocheting, sewing, um, she also, her and her sister Elizabeth take gymnastics and take um, ballet classes, so they both love that. Um, Elizabeth, who is nine years old, besides the ballet and the gymnastics, she is very, she has gotten very interested in um, prenatal development this pregnancy. It started when our livestock guardian dog had puppies last December. She became kind of my doggy doula and helped me out when we were caring for the puppies and during Leela's labor and just became fascinated with the birthing process. 
And so when I found out I was pregnant, one of the first things that she said is, can I be at the birth? Can I catch the baby? Those kinds of things. And so she has gone along to every one of my prenatal appointments. Every week she do, gives me a little midwife <laughs> um, evaluation where she measures the baby and she listens for the heartbeat and she reads about whatever prenatal development is going on that um, week. So I can definitely see her, if she continues down this road, doing something in nursing or midwif midwifery or maybe even veterinary care, something kind of um, in that realm. But yeah, and then the little boys are little boys. You know, they have their interests and their play things. They are really into Paw Patrol right now and puppies. So that's what we deal with. So yes, that's where the children are at with their interests, their career aspirations. The only one that really has a solidified plan right now is my oldest because he's starting to think about college. He is definitely planning to go kind of the computer programming route and will begin taking college classes for that next year at age 16. So that, I think that's about it um, about the children. Hopefully that answers some of your questions there. Since I just mentioned Leela, Leela is our dog. I had several questions about our dogs and I don't really talk about them much. I don't even think I really talked about their, um, the puppies much last year other than maybe featuring them in a couple videos and that was kind of for a specific reason. People get very touchy about breeding dogs and so I guess I'll talk about that first before I get into our specific breed of dogs and why we breed them. Um, but uh, we have Boz Shepherds. They are Turkish Boz Shepherds. They're kind of like cousins of Anatolian Shepherds and Kangles. They're a land race breed based out of Turkey. Um, that sort of means that in the varying regions of turkeys, the dogs have kind of naturally bred themselves to have very distinct differences. To the American eye, all of these um, dogs look very similar, but if you're someone who kind of studies them, you can see that, like ours, the Boz Shepherd, they're much bigger than an Anatolian. Their body shape is more squared. Their face shape is slightly different, so there are distinct differences that you know, set these different breeds apart. So they are Boz Shepherds and you see them in a lot of our videos. Um, they are a livestock guardian breed. And if you don't know what that is, these dogs, livestock guardian dogs, have innate characteristics that make them perfect for guarding and protecting livestock. livestock. They have a high drive to um, keep predators away and they also have innate instincts that make them want to protect other large livestock. So whereas you might have you might have other animals that have a high predator drive that will keep predators away, but they also might see a baby calf or a baby goat as something that they would want to go after too. A livestock guardian will kind of innately see these animals as something that it's their job to protect. So um, when people say, why are you breeding those dogs? There's so many dogs in shelters that need homes. When someone is looking for a livestock guardian dog, they need a dog that they have trained from the time that they were a puppy on their property with their animals to understand their specific um, property. You can't go take just any breed out there. Like I couldn't just go adopt a mixed, you know, poodle and lab and bring it to my home and expect it to serve as a livestock guardian for my animals. It would not do the same job. It doesn't have the same instincts. Um, and even in terms of rehoming, like there are a lot of livestock guardian groups out there that are trying to rehome dogs, but a lot of times you can't trust an adult dog that's being rehomed. There's often a reason they're being rehomed and you really can have a hard time integrating those adult, adult dogs onto a property to protect your livestock, especially if they have been rehomed due to specific reasons that uh, might not be good <laughs> for your livestock. So um, there is a need out there. They are a working breed. So this is very different than just designer dogs or um, just a breed that you're creating for looks or for companionship or something like that these dogs serve a purpose and that's why we choose to breed them. If there's a need out there, we feel like we're filling the need. There are very few Boz Shepherd breeders out there and we love this breed so much that we wanted to be able to provide quality puppies to people that also love this breed. 
So we have three dogs. Leela is our female and she is five years old. Um, Tom is our male and he's four. And then they had puppies last December and we kept one male from that litter, Harry, and he will turn one in December. They're great dogs. They do a great job on our property. Some of you have asked if we do have plans to breed again. Um, yes, we plan to breed Leela at least one more time. Um, and she's actually in heat right now and we're having to keep her separated from Tom because if she were to get pregnant at this moment, she would be due exactly at the time that I'm due to have a baby and it's just some chaos that we're trying to avoid happening. So we do not have plans to breed her again um, until next spring. So she would likely then have puppies in June and that's the plan there. Um, in terms of training, I had lots of questions about how we have to train our dogs. As I mentioned, most of the characteristics that make livestock guardian dogs special are just innate, no training necessary. Now, there is some training that needs to be done with chickens. In my experience, livestock guardian dogs don't necessarily view chickens as livestock. They view them as little fun, flittery, <laughs> squeaky toys. So you, there definitely is some training that has to be done there in teaching dogs to respect um, to respect birds, and I've often found that that's something that it's just a puppy issue. You know, puppies like to chew on things and chase things, and once our do our older dogs reached age two, it just didn't become a problem anymore. They stopped chasing the chickens, so you just have to watch them like you would watch any puppy. Obviously, there's chewing issues. You need to, you know, <laughs> teach them, you know, not to do chew on things that you don't want them to chew on. Um, but otherwise, all we do to train our livestock guardians when we get them is we teach them the property boundaries. Our property is fenced in, so we just walk that property line with them to show them what they're responsible for patrolling, and that's about it. That's all you have to do. Um, livestock guardian dogs are not necessarily a good fit for someone who lives in a busy area that does not have quality fencing. Livestock guardian dogs are known to roam that's often they might hear coyotes in the distance at night and they start barking to deter them. And if the coyotes aren't going away, they might often take off to get closer to where they hear them to push them further away from the animals that they're in charge of um, protecting and things. Livestock guardian dogs also bark all night long. <laughs> That's their job. That's the number one thing that they do is their bark is supposed to deter predators. They're making their presence known so that with the coyotes who are looking for an easy meal know not to come to this place because the dogs are there protecting. So they do bark a lot. If you live in a, a neighborhood, they're not a neighborhood dog. <laughs> they're not really good for that. You want to be somewhere where your neighbors aren't going to be annoyed by a barking livestock guardian dog. But we love ours. They do a great job. They are great family protectors too, despite their size. Like my male is 180 pounds. He is great with my children. He lets them play and crawl on him. And he's like a nanny dog that will just, you know, he would protect them from anything that would try to harm them, but he also would never hurt them. And they are just the sweetest dogs. I love them. You guys had questions about dog food. Yes, <laughs> big dogs. A 180 pound dog is going to go through a lot of food. We currently purchase our dog food. We do not make our own. Um, there are three dogs to feed. We do a mix of a Diamond Naturals large breed dog food as well as, I think it's called Taste of the Wild, another large breed. And Adam mixes those half and half. He's responsible for dog care. That's his job. So he purchases feed and, and deals with all of that. Um, I do, I, I'm even looking into, I have plans to one day maybe breed meat rabbits specifically for the purpose of feeding the dogs. Um, I would love to have a sustainable food source here, and I feel like meat rabbits, they reproduce so quickly, it could be an abundant food source, and that food would go specifically for the dogs. We, um, we have to be careful because, like, I would never breed chickens or ducks or things like that to feed the dogs because I don't want them to get a taste for that and recognize it and then want to go after um, the chickens or ducks because they see them as, as the food source. So whatever I would choose, like if it were meat rabbits, those would be um, specifically, you know, for them and uh, their food source. But anyways, yeah, if you have any other questions about livestock guardian dogs, let me know. We love our dogs. They're great. They 
are a security system that protect us from predators of the animal variety and the human variety. So we love them very much. Okay guys, let's talk about food allergies. So I've, um, I've gone into great length, great detail before in other Q&As about our situation with food allergies. So let me just give you a brief rundown. So our oldest son, Gabriel, was diagnosed with an anaphylactic food allergy at two months old. And I just mentioned that in passing in a previous video and had a lot of <laughs> confused people like, how would a two month old, how would you find out that a two month old has food allergies? Why are you feeding your two month old food? And I wanna clarify that we were not giving our two month old solid food. There are many ways that a food allergy can be detected without a child actually eating food. There are varying levels of food allergies. Some people have allergies that are so severe, like my son, that they can have a contact allergy. So even if they don't ingest or eat the food, if somebody has that peanut butter on their hands or has butter on their hands and touches him, he can react to that allergen just through his skin. So yes, <laughs> at two months old, he wasn't eating food. What had actually happened is um, Gabriel was exclusively breastfed by me. He could tolerate my breast milk at that point. And I had to go away for the first time. It was like one of the first times I had ever left Gabe at home alone with Adam. He was only two months old and I had left some breast milk in the fridge for him. But Adam, you know, the baby's crying, new father, it's our first child. And he's like, I don't know what to do. And, um, he couldn't find the milk in the fridge for some reason, so he made him a bottle of formula, and it was the first time Gabriel had ever had formula. It was a milk-based formula that also contained soy protein. And he, I was due to be home. I was tried to space my outing so that I would be home before he got hungry again, but it was just at the tail end. He was getting hungry. So Adam was just finishing the bottle with him as I walked in the door. And we're talking about how it went, you know, that I was gone. And then all of a sudden, within about five minutes of finishing the bottle, his little lips started to swell. And he was only two months old. You know how tiny his is and how, uh, how tiny a two-month-old is. His lips had already swelled to twice the size that they normally were. And I looked at him and I said, something's not right. And we immediately took him to the emergency room. And they told us he was having an anaphylactic reaction to something that was in the formula. Obviously, we had to do some additional testing to determine whether it was the milk protein or the soy protein or something else in the formula. And through that blood test at two months old, they determined that he was allergic to both milk and soy. So we had to avoid those from that point on. And then as Gabriel, as he got older, not two months old, we introduced solid foods when he was older, but between six and eight months. As we introduced foods, because he had a history of food allergies, we had to do it very slowly, one food at a time every week to give his body time to eat it and to see if he would react. And through the course of introducing foods, by the time he was maybe a year and a half old, he was allergic to milk, soy, peanuts, um, eggs, tomatoes, and pineapple. And we had him tested with the milk for both cow's milk and goat's milk, and he was allergic to both. So it was a very challenging early childhood years with Gabriel, um, navigating all of those allergies. Try making a birthday cake without eggs, milk, soy. <laughs> it was, and I was not a good cook back then. I was, you know, this was 15 years ago. I was new to all of this. I was a brand new wife. We had Gabriel nine months after we got married. I was new to being a wife and keeping a home. It was very challenging. Um, so anyways, that's the history of his food allergies. I know I had a lot of questions about how that happened. By the time he was school age, he had outgrown everything except for the milk and peanuts. And those are the allergens that still exist to this day. He's 15 years old, still allergic to those. I've gone through in different Q and A's in great detail how that has, has impacted our life and what we're able to do because of the severity of his allergies, it being a contact allergy. Um, it sort of limits, you know, we can't go to a bowling alley because they eat pizza. Everybody's eating pizza and with the cheesy fingers, they're touching the bowling balls and it's everywhere. And, you know, it's hard for him to go to a movie theater because of the chocolate everybody's eating and touching seats and things. And, um, it's definitely gotten easier as he's gotten older because now he's old enough to know 
never to put his hands either in his mouth or nose or eyes while he's in public. And that is extremely helpful because his reactions are generally more severe if the allergens actually are ingested. And so that's just a, a thing that he's trained himself to do to just not touch. And that's just good, a good thing to do anyways. There's germs in public besides the allergens. So not touching your mouth or your nose or your eyes is just good practice. So it's um, better too that he's older too because he now has the confidence and the understanding to ask even if we're at a family gathering where it's already been determined that everything is safe because that is our request. We do not go to any family gathering where his allergens would be served. We made that decision probably 10 years ago or so and our families love Gabriel enough and want him to be safe that they were willing to forgo um, dairy and peanuts at our gatherings and we are forever grateful to that because for that because we couldn't participate otherwise and so but now that he's older he asks okay who you know who made this pie I just want to double check is there anything in this and um so that is very helpful for him as he gets older so a lot of you have asked um what will happen as Gabe gets older and leaves the house so his plan is to go a traditional college route. He, as I mentioned, would like to study some kind of computer programming or computer science. And I think that's a perfect fit for him career-wise because there are so many options for him to work in a safe work environment. He can work remotely or from home. He doesn't necessarily have to be in a traditional um, setting where he could be exposed to allergens with that you know, career path. Um, college will probably have to look a little different for him. I'm sure he would get some kind of medical exemption from living in a dorm if he did need to live on campus somewhere. He would always need, obviously, access to his own kitchen to cook his food safely. And so, you know, he would get a medical exemption. He would live in off-campus housing with a kitchen and prepare his own food. I think as of right now, he has plans to kind of stay close to home. He'll probably live at home while he goes to college unless plan, you know, plans can change in the next three years. He's only 15. Um, and so that is the plan for him. Um, in terms of having a social life, yes, he's able to have a social life. He has friends that he gets together with. He goes to our homeschool group outings with us. Everybody in our homeschool group is aware of his allergens and doesn't bring those to the you know, the gatherings that we go to to protect him. And there are other kids in our group that have other allergens. Um, there's a child with celiac disease, and so we all know not to bring anything with gluten to that. And so it just works out. These We, we live in a time where we need to be aware of these things. And I'm proud of this younger generation that's coming up that they're also understanding and they recognize that this is just something people have to live with and um, they don't complain about it and they all try to accommodate one another and it's just a beautiful thing. So he is able to have um, relationships. You know, Gabriel is going to have to be very careful as he gets older to not put himself in risky situations. Um, if people were to get intoxicated and let their guard down, um, you know, that would be very risky for him to do. He shouldn't put himself in a situation where he would be um, having mouth contact with another hu human being that could potentially have his allergens in their mouth. And I think these are behaviors that he shouldn't be engaging in anyway. So this is a way that God will protect him and keep him from, um, you know, getting inebriated and, and kissing people and, <laughs> and doing things that he shouldn't be doing um, before he's, you know, married anyway. So that's what life will have to look like for him. Um, how to prepare. One of the questions was, does Gabriel cook? And yes, all of my children, from the time they're able to, you've seen them helping me in the kitchen. They're all learning how to cook meals. They all, by the time they leave the nest, will have a repertoire of um, allergy-free uh, recipes that they know how to cook for themselves. And so Gabe is no exception. If he does live um, away from home in off-campus housing, he will need to cook for himself and he will be prepared to know how to do that. Otherwise, some people have asked, do my other children who don't have allergies, do they ever have opportunities to be exposed to their allergens? And yes, all of my children at some point in their lives have been exposed to dairy 
and peanuts. And so we know whether, you know what? Oh, Benjamin. Benjamin might not have been exposed to peanuts yet, not intentionally. So that's one we don't know about, but everybody else has been exposed. So we do know that they don't have those allergies. Um, it's really strange because allergies are supposed to be genetic. And in most families where you find severe food allergies, you know, you, other siblings have it. So for us to have so many other siblings and not have it, um, I, I have a lot of theories on that in terms of how I changed um, how I took care of myself during pregnancy and things with subsequent children after Gabriel. But those are just anecdotal theories that I won't share with you. But anyways, my children um, have all, all other than Gabriel, have had fast food before when they are one-on-one -on -one with grandparents or aunts and uncles. They've been taken to restaurants. Um, let's say if Gabriel goes and spends the weekend with his grandparents and it's just Adam and I home with some of the children that don't have allergies, we'll take them to a restaurant so we can expose them to that environment and teach them table manners and how to behave in public when they're eating and things like that. So yeah, I mean, I think it's a good balance for the kids. You know, it's not necessarily healthy for them to be eating at restaurants and eating fast food frequently anyways. So I, this is just one of the blessings of food allergy life is that God hasn't made that a possibility for us and the kids are protected from that and they get home cooked meals pretty much three times a day. Um, and I feel like that's a benefit for them and not something that they're missing out on by not being able to, you know, order takeout and eat fast food more frequently than they do. So hopefully that answers all of that. All right. So let's talk about the garden. The big question of the year was, dude, did I end up liking the raised beds? So you guys know that I completely re redid my garden this year. We laid down landscape fabric as a weed suppressor and I brought in all new raised beds and we brought in garden soil and filled them up. Um, and I would say 70% of my garden was raised beds and I left about 30% of it just <clears throat> bare ground the way it was before um, for a couple reasons. Part of that garden had garlic planted in it, you know, from the year before, so I couldn't convert it. Another part of it I wanted to test tomatoes that I was growing in the ground versus tomatoes that I was growing in the raised beds to see if I preferred it one way or the other. So the verdict is that um, I much prefer the raised beds. Um, our soil here where we're at in Ohio is extremely heavy clay. And as much as over the last seven years, I've tried to work that soil and get it into something that I can grow food in really well. Um, you know, we've brought in all sorts of amendments. We worked those in we've um I just still our our soil has terrible drainage where our garden is um and so the soil that we brought in that we put in the raised beds I feel like I just had a way more productive garden this year because of that so that's the first thing I loved about it was that um the soil was much better in the raised beds the weed suppression the areas where I didn't put down the weed fabric because I was trying to grow in ground. Obviously I was pregnant this year. Things as usual, every year there's an excuse. <laughs> there's either a newborn baby or I'm pregnant it seems like and everything falls apart, but <clears throat> excuse me, the areas where I didn't have weed fabric down, it's a mess. It just became a jungle of weeds. And so I think I've just learned that in this season of, of life for me, the whole thing needs to be raised beds. And that is the plan for next year. Um, what I'll do differently next year, I will install some kind of irrigation system because it was a lot of watering. The one thing about particularly the metal raised beds that I used, they dry out and they can, you know, they get a little hotter than any other kind of material that you might make a, a raised bed out of. So through the height of the summer when it was really hot out, I was having to water twice a day. And that would have been much more manageable if I had a nice irrigation system set up where I could just hook a hose up to it and everything would be watered for me, um, then I could just go shut the hose off <laughs> after it's adequately watered. So that is what we will do next year on top of converting the rest of the space into raised beds. Otherwise, it was a great year. I'm going to do like a garden wrap-up year here, a garden wrap-up video for the year here in probably a couple weeks. I still have a few more things that I need to harvest. We're getting our first frost tonight, so... After this video is over, I've got to head out to the garden and salvage what I want to save. 
Um, and then we still have some cold hardy things that are growing that will probably continue to grow through the end of the month. Um, and then I'll have a good tally on what our total harvests were. And then what I always like to do every year is calculate how much money I saved growing that food. And I have a whole system I use to do that. And I want to share that in a video for you guys. So yeah, the garden did great this year. I'm, I'm pleased and also very looking forward to the frost tonight because I'm ready to put that part of my life away, put it to bed for the year and really put myself now into nesting mode and get ready for the more important thing that I've been growing this year, which is a new baby. So speaking of the new baby, just a quick pregnancy update. There were just a couple questions relating to the pregnancy that I wanted to address. So I am 30 weeks right now and my due date is December 12th. I typically go late with my babies all of them except for one have been at least to the due date or longer. The longest I've gone, I went two weeks overdue with Elizabeth, but the average is about a week overdue. So that's what I'm planning. Uh, my guess for a date is December 18th that I will give birth, but I can be proven wrong. <laughs> um, we do not know the gender. We don't find out. We like to wait, and we really enjoy that surprise. I had a question about my birth plans. Um, we are planning another home birth. We had our first two children in the hospital with a hospital-based midwife. I've had my last five children at home with a home birth midwife, and we've really enjoyed the home birth experience. So Lord willing, as long as I remain healthy and baby looks fine, we will plan to have this baby at home. But um, I'm open, you know, if there for any reason that doesn't seem like a safe option, we will definitely head to the hospital. Uh, many people have asked, do I seek prenatal care? And yes, I do have a very qualified midwife who is um, watching over me <laughs> through this pregnancy. I, at this point, see her once a month and pretty soon here we we'll can start seeing her more frequently. I do most of the normal prenatal testing, like um, just my last, last week at my appointment, I did the gestational diabetes test, which I passed, which is was a relief and <laughs> wonderful. Um, but yeah, so I do all of that normal testing with my midwife. She's here. She usually brings a backup person when I deliver. She has all of the equipment that can manage things like me bleeding heavily or um, she knows how to resuscitate the baby. My particular midwife is also on top of being a certified nurse midwife is also, or I'm sorry, a certified professional midwife. She is also a licensed EMT. So she knows all about resuscitation. I am in great hands. You guys don't have to worry. Um, a lot of you have asked if I'll be videoing the birth and it's not likely, um, mostly because I always prefer to be in the dark when I'm laboring. So it would be pretty boring for you guys to have a video of the dark unless we had some kind of like night vision camera and I'm not going to go to those links. I'm also, there are some things that I prefer to keep private and I tend to, you never kind of know how I'm going to react in labor and what kind of clothing I'm going to want to be wearing. So we'll probably keep the labor um, to ourselves. I might have Adam try to film some clips here and there so that as I'm telling my birth story for you guys, I can um, have some footage for you, but we'll probably not be filming um, the actual birth, but I will be sure to do a um, birth story video to let you guys know how it went so otherwise pregnancy's going good as I said I just passed my gestational diabetes um, test baby's measuring great um, I'm feeling okay I'm starting to reach that point in the third trimester where I feel tired and sluggish my pelvis hurts um, heartburn all of the normal stuff I won't sit here and complain to you but um it's to be expected and I'm also 41 years old so <laughs> I'm no spring chicken <laughs> it's not gonna um it's not gonna be as easy as it was with my first child at 25 or 26 so I'm hanging in there and I'm looking forward to as I mentioned putting you know the outdoor growing the gardening season to bed and now I'm really throwing myself into nesting mode Got to get out all the baby stuff, get things washed and put away, and everything's set up for the new baby. So, exciting stuff. Okay, really quickly, just some stuff about homeschooling. I had lots of questions, probably more than anything else, about homeschooling. It's not something I tend to talk a lot about here. Um, 
food preservation and homesteading stuff seems to be um, what people prefer to hear more about. But if you're someone who likes would like to hear more about homeschooling, let me know in the comments and I'll try to include more videos for you about that. But um, just a brief overview. I currently have five children that are officially at the age where I have to register them for homeschooling. We, I have a kindergartner, a fourth grader, a sixth grader, an eighth grader, and Gabriel is in ninth grade. So this is our first year dealing with high school and it is slightly different. I tend to take a very loose approach to homeschooling through elementary school years. We focus on only the basics, pretty much only on reading, writing, and math when up until about maybe fifth grade. And I just want them to have a really good solid foundation in those subjects. And then of course, as a family together, we do read alouds in Bible and history and other topics. But the core of the curriculum they focus on is in reading, writing, and math. Once they get into middle school, I start to introduce other subjects in just to kind of get them used to having a larger course load. But then high school, ninth grade, for Gabriel, this is the first year where he has about seven subjects, I believe, that he is doing. And he's working on learning how to manage his time. There's been a lot of focus on study skills and things because I do not do tests or quizzes with my kids before high school. So Gabriel is easing into that, that difference and he's doing a great job. It's wonderful. He's a good student. He's a firstborn, you know, they're very, <laughs> they're very obedient. They just sort of do what they um, are asked and it's going wonderfully for him. And he's setting a great example for his younger siblings. So um, otherwise, in terms of specific curriculum that or curricula that we use, I've done videos on that before. If you follow me on Instagram, I have highlights all about that. I'll try to do an updated video, but for the most part, we use teaching textbooks for math. It's a computer-based curriculum. It works great for us because if I had to grade and teach five different lessons of math every day, it would occupy my entire day <laughs> with the kids. So teaching textbooks, the computer handles that for me. It does the grading, and then I just check in with them every day and ask them what grade they got. If the grade isn't adequate, um, isn't at the standard that I want it to be at, then we will sit down together and we will review what they're having trouble with. Um, we start teaching textbooks at grade four, kindergarten through third grade. I do Saxon math with the child. So uh, Levi is the only one that I'm actually sitting down doing a daily math lesson with right now. Um, language arts, we use a wide variety of stuff. Um, I'm using My Father's World first grade for kindergarten with Levi right now. And we really like that. My girls are using the Institute for Excellence in Writing. It's called IEW, and they have a DVD writing curriculum. That's what they're doing right now. Their focus this year is really working on writing skills. And then they also have some spelling curricula that they do. Um, David and Gabriel are both using a Becca language arts right now. Um, I just needed something a little more structured and comprehensive for them as they're entering their high school years, and that's what we use. Otherwise, um, someone asked if I ever create my own curricula, and I definitely do. I prefer to do that. I don't know. I sometimes feel like tied down by teacher guides and doing these checklists that are provided in these curricula that I buy. So I'm a big fan of just compiling my own. Um, I've done everything from we've done a year long anatomy lesson when I've been pregnant before based on development of the baby and then learning about those parts in our own bodies. I've created curriculum for that before. We've done entire years where I've created curriculum on um, science topics that dealt with whatever we're doing on the homestead. Um, if it's voting season, if there's a presidential election in that year, we'll do an entire year's unit on um, voting and how it works and all of the um, branches of the government and all of that kind of stuff. And we just kind of take life and whatever's going on that's relevant, we discuss it. Like for example, the kids typically do independent work in their math and their language arts. And then we often come together for these other um, 
his other lessons. And then until high school, obviously, Gabriel has all of the lessons. He has a language arts, math. He's doing a health class, a earth science class. He's doing geography, um, history. I don't know if there's like seven of them total. I think um, a logic class too, something like that. But anyway, so he's got a full course load on top of whatever we're talking about together. So, all right. And otherwise, in terms of homeschool, common question. A lot of people want to know if one of my children ever wanted to go to public school, is that an option? And first thing I always think of when somebody asks me that, because most of the time those questions come from parents who have their children in public school, is I always want to turn the question around and ask them if their public school child wanted to be homeschooled, would that parent consider that? Um, and so I think in both situations, the families, first of all, have a specific family culture that they live in. We have a homeschool family culture. And if one of my children wanted to go to public school, it would disrupt the culture of the family. Doesn't mean that it, we, I would say, no, you can't go to public school, but it's a last resort. The first thing that I would do is I would sit down and ask my child, okay, what are your reasons for wanting to go to public school? Is it because you feel like you want to be around kids more? Well, let's first see if we can still do homeschooling, but get involved in more groups where you can be around kids and see if that will satisfy that desire. Um, maybe it's if they, if they say, well, um, the learning environment's too chaotic at home and I, I, just, I feel like I want to try a different environment or something. I don't know. Okay, so let's see if we can set you up in a learning space that would be better for you or whatever. I mean, I guess I would want to address the issue with them first to see why they would want to go to public school. Is it just curiosity? You want to see what it's like? You know, what, what's going on? Because if we make that choice for them to go to public school, it is going to completely disrupt the family culture. And that would be worth it if, if there's no other way for them to fulfill whatever need there is inside of them. If there's a social need that isn't being fulfilled in a homeschool environment, of course I will go to whatever lengths you know, I can to, to make that happen for them, but there, there will be a cost of disrupting the normal flow of the day. That child now has to be commuted to and from school and it's going to disrupt what the other children are doing with their homeschool work in the morning. So, and I think that the answer would be the same for most public school parents. Like if they have a family of three or four kids and they all attend public school and one of their children suddenly wants to be homeschooled, well, they have a, a current family culture that is working for them. Um, that parent now suddenly has to figure out, well, who's going to watch over, who's going to be teaching the lessons, you know? Um, if they work, they're going to have to figure out how they can now change their work schedule to be home with their child. That's a huge adjustment for the family culture. And so that's something you're only going to change the family culture culture. If that child, literally, there's no other way that they can thrive academically, you know, unless they were to come home. So short, short answer is if I did have a child that wanted to um, go to public school, would I let them? I mean, if that's what it would take for them to thrive and there were no other way, then I mean, probably not public school. We would look into private school options, um, but I... Um, you know, I would probably address the underlying reasons before we would jump to that. And I think that's what most parents would do. We homeschool because we believe in it. And there's a reason we chose this for our children. And sometimes parents make decisions for their children because they know what's best for them. Children don't always know what's best for them. And so there's a thin line or there's a, a line there that um, you kind of have to balance what you know is best for your child and also giving them a little bit of what they think is best for them, but not putting them in a situation that you think is actually going to be a detriment to them. So I don't know, I'm kind of getting rambly, but hopefully that, <laughs> that makes sense. Um, otherwise, other question that I had is, do we school year round or do we follow a traditional schedule? We do school year round. Every year is different. We take breaks as needed. This year we'll be taking a rather large break, um, probably for the first four weeks after the baby is born. We typically take a break during the heaviest part of canning season. We sometimes take a break when we're planting and trying to get the garden in the ground. Um, every year it's sort of different. 
and that's what works for us. We just fit the school in where, where it fits um, the family schedule and the seasonal schedule, and that's what we like. So, all right, that's enough about homeschool. All right, really quickly, let's do this last category, um, well, second to last category, <laughs> of food and food preservation. So one of the questions I got asked was, um, what's the hardest part of food preservation for me? And as a mom with a growing family, I definitely find that the hardest part is gauging every year how much food to preserve because uh, my kids are getting bigger every year and our family seems to be growing every year. So what works one year definitely will not work the next year. Teenagers eat way more food <laughs> than toddlers do. So every year I'm having to um, reevaluate how much I need to store. And it's reached the point now where the question isn't how much should I store, it's how much can I store. Because if we store it and preserve it, they will eat it. It's just going to get... <laughs> There's never enough. So, um, so yeah, that's kind of the hardest part. Someone asked, what is my daily kitchen cleaning routine? Because I'm always working in the kitchen. How do I keep it from becoming a disaster? Um, you guys, I'm working in a really small space. I don't know if the videos do it justice for you to see exactly how tiny my kitchen space is. It's very small. And I have a lot of equipment that I use on a daily basis. You know, I've got canners, I've got crock pots, I've got mixers, I've got grain mills. <laughs> There's a lot. My kitchen rarely looks tidy and clean. There's always stuff out on the counters and it's a working kitchen. That's just the way it is. Um, but I try to keep it sanitary at least. So it may look cluttered, <laughs> but at least it's clean. And so what I have to do is after every meal, after breakfast, lunch, and dinner, I always have to do the dishes. And I always try to do a wipe down of my butcher block area that I do a lot of my work on. I always wipe down my stove after every time I cook on it and then I have to sweep the floor literally four or five times a day because of you know things that are happening in the kitchen and spills that happen with children um, I try to clean my sink out at the end of the day after all of the dishes have been done I try to get that at least clean and sanitary before we start the next day but otherwise it's just one of those things where um, while I'm standing in the kitchen waiting on maybe a canner to come to pressure or while I'm waiting for dinner to finish cooking, I just, there's always something that can be organized and straightened up and cleaned. And I just try to do something <laughs> instead of standing there. And um, that's what I have to do. We do not currently have a functioning dishwasher. You guys can only imagine the amount of dishes that a family of nine makes for one meal between the cooking, the pots and the pans, <laughs> and then the utensils and the plates and the cups and everything that goes into it. It's a lot of dishes. Um, but with our hard water, we like we need a new water softener or something because we can't keep dishwashers alive here. And so I've just kind of resigned to washing by hand. And it's a big goal before the baby comes is to have the children take over that chore. Two years ago, it wasn't, you know, I think we tried to do that. And the children, I just find, weren't as thorough in washing as I wanted them to be. And I was having to rewash things. And it just was this huge hassle where I was like, it's fine, I'll just do it but we're reaching a point where it's like, I think that they're old enough to, to do that thoroughly and adequately and take that over. So we're going to work on that. And that would make my life a whole lot easier. Um, especially as the baby comes, but yeah, I just clean as I go. And I think that's the end. Um, another question that I thought was interesting. Someone asked, does your husband ever question how much time you spend in the kitchen? So, um, this is funny. <laughs> I think Adam would be happy when he comes home at the end of a long work day. He'd be happy eating anything that I put on the table. He is not picky. You know, I'm picky. Like, I want homegrown organic produce. I want homegrown meat. I want things cooked from scratch. Adam is just hungry after work. So, I don't think, I think he'd be just as happy if I opened a can of Spam and just had plain rice there if, he, if it would fill his belly. <laughs> so, I think sometimes he does... Um, maybe think that I spend a lot of time in the kitchen, but I think he also recognizes that it's important to me. I have health issues that require me to eat a certain way. We have a son with food allergies that um, require him to have home-cooked food because we can't buy a lot of store-bought food or I can't just order takeout when I'm having, you know, a busy day or whatever. And 
I think that he also recognizes how much money I save him by doing the things that I do. So he would never complain. He would never come to me and be like, you spend too much time in the kitchen. You need to put your focus other, you know, elsewhere. I think he appreciates what I do, even if it's not necessarily like his top priority. Um, you know, if he, if the roles were switched and I was the husband going to work and he were the wife, he would, I don't know, maybe he would care less about the food because it's just not, not a thing for him. Um, anyways, finally, I'm just going to answer some questions that were just like random that I couldn't kind of fit into a category. And that was, one of them was about Adam and was what are his contributions to the homestead? Um, I get so many comments about how I do too much or the kids do too much and Adam doesn't do too, do enough around here. And it's funny to me because I'm not following Adam around with a camera all day for you guys to see what he actually does. He works very hard for our family, both when he's away from home and when he's home. His particular responsibilities here around the homestead include um, mowing outside of the gate. As of a year ago, he did all of the mowing for our four acres, um, but Gabriel has now taken over the riding of the property. So anything within inside the fence, the two big boys now handle, but Adam does everything outside the fence. And our property is like a long rectangle that has a lot of um, frontage on the road. And so there is a wide area outside the fence between the fence and the road that is on a steep incline that can't be on a ride. You can't mow it with a rider. He has to push mow that every week and that takes him quite a bit of time. So he handles that. Um, he handles procuring all of the firewood for us for the winter. As you guys know, we um, do not have a furnace in our home. We heat exclusively with wood, with our wood stove. And tonight actually is the first time we're going to have to fire that up because it's going to drop below freezing tonight. Um, and we typically go through four to five cords of wood in a winter. So it's Adam's job all through the summer. A lot of his weekends when he's home are spent splitting wood and stacking wood, chopping down dead trees, going to my parents' property where they have a woods and getting wood and those kinds of things. So he does that. He's also in charge of any maintenance projects. And I told you guys, we live in a 150 year old house. So there are always things breaking <laughs> around here that need attention. And so that's a lot of Adam's um, work as well. And he's just our handyman. He's doing the odd jobs. You know, just uh, last night he was working for two hours. He was moving. We had taken down a willow tree and it's wood that's not really suitable for burning. Willow doesn't burn very hot. It's kind of a junky wood. And it had just been sitting in a pile there for a while. And so he spent two hours last night when he got home from work moving that wood to the back of the property to get it out of our main space our main area to kind of clean it up a little bit and so you know we have four acres we have an old house we have animals when he comes home I basically hand him my honey-do list of things that I can't accomplish or that the kids can't accomplish and he just hops to it so he definitely pulls his weight around here you guys don't need to worry my job as a stay-at-home mom I feel like I want to do as much as I can to prevent him having a huge honey-do list when he gets home at the end of the day because I want him available for my kids. He works outside of the home. My kids only have their evenings and they only have their weekends with their dad. I don't want him spending every evening and every weekend doing work projects. I want him spending that time really investing in my children. My children get to be around me all day, every day. They hear from me. They get to have Bible lessons for me as part of their schoolwork, but they only have evenings and weekends with their father. And so, um, I'd honestly prefer it if he did less work <laughs> around the homestead and we had even more time for um, time together. So you don't have to worry about me. I am happy with the power distribution in our marriage. I'm happy with the distribution of work. We're doing what works for us. Um, I feel like it's very fair and balanced and you guys don't have to worry about us. So final questions that I think we're good to kind of wrap this up. People have asked me um, how I manage YouTube. How do I manage doing this with everything else I have on my plate? And I just want to say um, the only way I've been able to manage it in the last year is through the style of video that I've been producing for you guys. I'm a busy mom and um, it takes away from my family if I'm holding a camera and narrating what I'm doing to you guys while we're doing it. 
because my focus, if I'm doing that, is on the camera and you guys and not on the actual activity that I'm doing and trying to do with my children. And I want to be authentic for you guys. I'm not doing these kitchen projects and things for you. <clears throat> I'm mostly doing them for my family and to teach them how to do them. And so the focus is on them. And so the best thing for me to do is to film what I'm doing naturally and then to go back and voice it over later for you guys. And so that's a way that everybody can benefit from it. But that's the only way this has been manageable. If I tried to take away from my children and film for you guys instead, um, I feel like my focus would be wrong and the children wouldn't be getting... Um, wouldn't be getting the best of me if that makes sense and so that's how I've been able to manage it is I film Monday through Friday typically whatever regular work we would normally be doing I would be doing it whether there's a camera there or not and I just film it and then typically on Saturdays I sit down and I edit it and compile it together into the video that you see and then I will voice it over quickly and that's what you guys see so I hope you guys like or appreciate that style because that's the only way that I can really um, get it done without taking away from my children. And I know some of you have asked if I could do more videos in a week. And honestly, um, unless I were to take the current videos that I'm doing and shorten them into two smaller videos, um, I, I feel like this is the amount of content that is manageable for me in this season of life. And... I enjoy it. It's a wonderful outlet for me to kind of be creative. I love to have to teach and help others. So I'm grateful for the opportunity. And that's my final question. Somebody asked, what's one positive and one negative that has come out of YouTube for me? And so the positive, one of the positive things has been that this is a great outlet for me. I love, I love it. I love, um, interacting with you guys and being able to, um, share our life here with you because, um, I, I love what we're doing here. I love homesteading. I love homeschooling. I love having a lot of children. And I hope that that translates to you guys and you um, can kind of see the value in what we're doing here. Um, another positive, obviously, is that it's been a huge financial blessing for my family, particularly this year as my channel's picked up. And I'm grateful to each and every one of you that watches our videos um, and supports us in this way. The house project that I mentioned at the video, the beginning of this video is only going to be possible because of um, this channel. So I appreciate you so much. As far as negatives that have come out of YouTube, I mentioned before, there are times where I can feel like my attention is divided. Maybe where um, sometimes I'm worried about where, how's the placement of the camera while we're doing this. And so there's always that thought in the back of your mind where you're not 100% present with what you're doing with the children because that's there. But I've found ways to kind of lessen the interference in my life and make it um, so that I can continue to do the channel while still trying to be the best mom that I can be um, to my children. Some other negatives that have come out of it. Um, YouTube can be a cruel place at times. You guys, I'm sure reading through comments have, have seen that. And um, there are hurt people out there that want to hurt people. And so the constant criticism um, can sometimes wear on you. But I think it's been um, a blessing in disguise for me. Maybe it's a positive <laughs> in some ways. I've had to grow thicker skin. And it has taught me a lot about how I respond to other people that I disagree with. I think before I did YouTube, I would have been someone who was more likely to voice my disapproval or opposition to ideas that I hear um, in what other people share in their content. But I've learned through being on the receiving end of that, that it does no good. And that person putting the content out doesn't want to hear that, that they're not listening to it. You know, they're going to block it. They're going to, and, and why, why someone's taking their time to put something out into the world that is hopefully positive. Why would I need to try to bring them down because I would do something differently or I disagree with it. Um, so anyways, that's, that's a blessing. I'm learning. I'm growing. We're all learning and growing, hopefully. And so this is just one way that God is using this to ultimately, hopefully pull me nearer to him. All right, guys, that was a long Q and a, and I feel like I didn't even touch on half the stuff that I wanted to touch on, but, um, we'll have to do another one sometime. 
Thank you for watching, and I plan next week, now that Benji is fully potty trained, I can get back to a regular life next week. <laughs> we'll have a normal video next week for you, but all right, until then, guys, have a great week. Bye.